bad things happen yeah. in a market. That's a guarantee. Like the trading guarantee is something is going to go wrong. You're going to have this perfect thesis and boom, pull a vortex in your face, right? <laughs> or yes, it's bullish as all get out and the market's going to infinity and Freeport LNG blows up and there's a ton of gas on the market and boom, we vaporize two, three dollars, right? Right. right? That's th These things are just going to happen. You don't know when they're going to happen. They're just, that's the bargain of life. That's the bargain of trading. And what really matters is how do you react to it? Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities, and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building Smarter Markets be the antidote? Welcome back to Winter is Coming on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at ABEX Technologies. Our guest today is Bill Perkins, founder, managing partner, and head trader for Skylar Capital. We'll be discussing his trader's perspective on the natural gas, power, and carbon markets in Europe. Hello, Bill. Welcome to Smarter Markets. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's good great to be to here. Have you. Great to have yeah. you here. I'm so glad you're able to come in today because, you know, there's so much happening in the European energy markets. And I've been looking forward to hearing your perspective on it as both a trader and a hedge fund manager. Now, you not only saw this turbulent market situation developing, but, you know, you took action. You opened a new office in London this year for Skylar Capital to be ready for what I've heard you describe as the best trading opportunities in natural gas in 20 years. And I imagine if you're opening a new office, you see this as an opportunity with some legs to it, something that's going to be around for more than just a year. So I was hoping you could start us off by talking a little bit about what do you see as the big trading opportunity in European energy right now? Wow. I mean, things are changing every day going on in Europe right now. But what I generally see is, is that we have a situation where the amount of storage is not enough based on the demand and the amount of gas they use. So you have a lot of scenarios where you can either get to containment, right? And prices fall apart, but still not have enough gas to get you through the winter. And we used to have that, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago here domestically before storage grew. Then you have all these other factors with energy transition, the Russian war, we're going to cut off gas, we're going to ship LNG in, policymakers getting involved with subsidizing demand basically via price caps, maybe not subsidizing demand, nuclear issues, weather issues. I mean, there's just a lot of things to digest in the short term and long term. And long term, it's going to take a while for this market to become less volatile. So I see lots of opportunities, long, short, you know, just being the insurance agent, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, <laughs> for, for the market, right? Is that, That's basically what traders are, right? Like we insure against prices going up, we insure against prices going down based on the way we see the, the world. Yeah, so lots of volatility and traders love lots of volatility. And I'm like, I love the point you made about the inventory situation, because if you just kind of read the the press headlines, you know, a lot of it's you know, European leaders saying, hey, we've gotten uh, we've gotten storage filled up, even though for some of the storage, it looks like it's not much different than a, a normal five year average kind of level. But of course, it's what you have left at the end of the winter, not what you necessarily <laughs> what you start with at the beginning and those flows. So I'm kind of curious, like, how do you assess the inventory situation in Europe right now, given what they're likely facing this winter? Yeah, I mean, like any other winter, you know, they can fill to the brim and they still may run out of gas, right? Mm. Uh, this is in normal situations. But here we have the, you know, the Russians flowing, I don't know, one sixth of what they normally flow. That's being met by LNG, you know, high prices cure high prices. But, you know, will Russia cut off more gas flowing through Ukraine? Uh, has demand destruction been significant to get us to the winter? Or will, you know, winter be very warm and then we're flooded with gas or will it be cold and we run out of gas? I mean, there's a lot of scenarios that keep playing out. Right now, we're kind of in a situation where high prices cure high prices. The demand destruction is significant and the rest of the world is saying, we don't want the LNG at this price, right? At least a significant yeah. portion of it, right? So we have a reckon amount of LNG flowing to Northwest Europe and Western Europe, which, which looks crazy when you look at it on a map. But, you know, winter's coming <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the infrastructure isn't such that flowing LNG ships can 
necessarily replace flowing gas in a cold weather scenario. Hmm. So you have kind of this and or, you know, a shut off through Ukraine. And so you have this kind of it's priced high. You're kind of bearish, but maybe the expected value could be fair or high. You know, people are trying to figure this out. And, you know, when you start having policymakers get involved, you start to lose a free market, right? And I'm very good at trading markets, right. but am I good at trading Putin? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I'm not a good trader trading Putin. I, my, you know, these various schemes that they have that basically induce demand, you know, these caps, they're like, oh, we're going to. Mm. We're going to cap the price. I'm like, you're going to subsidize demand when you're running out of gas. This just makes no sense. You know, you know, I often say, had they made the price a complete pass through, the crisis is over in a day, hmm. in a day. And, you know, a lot of people retort, well, what happens to the people who can't afford it? I say, here's what you do. Instead of just blindly paying the bill, give everybody the amount that would be an increase and call it a pass through. And are they going to spend the extra thousand dollars on energy or are they going to conserve and go spend it on the nightclub? I think a lot of people go into the nightclub than spending on high electricity bill, right? They're going to turn things right. down. And so they're not putting forth schemes to conserve or, or produce demand destruction. They're just absolutely subsidizing demand, which is crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it is such a, you know, I don't know if it's commodity markets, people tend to focus on the volumes and making sure, you know, you got enough molecules in the right place. But policymakers, it always seems to be about the dollars or the euros. And you get these kind of counterproductive responses, which, as you say, you know, you're subsidizing the thing you don't have enough of. And that's not a way to bring a market back into balance. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you saying that it's the best trading opportunity in 20 years, uh, you know, really means a lot because, you know, you spent much of your early trading career with John Arnold at Centaurus and you traded very profitably through a number of pretty turbulent periods in the U.S. natural gas market. And I'm curious, you know, when you look at what's happening in Europe, are there similarities or things that you're like, oh, this reminds me of, you know, this particular time in the U.S.? Anything yeah, like it, that? Yeah, it does. You have, you well, prior to <laughs> what's happened recently, right? Because I've <laughs> said so. No invasions. You, yeah, you know, invasions. But you, you, had, you had growing demand, lack of infrastructure, this kind of like energy transition. And what, no matter what you thought about the energy transition, Energy transitions aren't smooth. They're lumpy, right? Infrastructure doesn't come on perfectly and match demand, right? You have this storage situation where they're not building new storage. So you have this scenario where you have contain. no matter how much you fill storage, you, have, you always have a risk of running out. And that was like the way it was in the early days yeah. of natural gas when we were putting down all these gas-fired power plants and growing our demand side of the equation and flows, but not increasing the storage, which storage is your shock absorber right? That's your shock absorber for volatility. And so, you know, I, I saw a landscape where we're going to have a lot of volatility, depending on what was going on, what was the weather, you know, what happened in global events. And so that's where traders want to be, right? Nobody wants to trade the boring, you know, 3% vol, 6% vol, 10% vol product. We were to trade the 80% vol product, you know? And when I was talking about this, I was like, oh, wow, 40 vol is cheap or 60 vol is cheap. And I'm like, you know, it's double that now, right? And <laughs> and we have scenarios where things will be moving around significantly. And since there's not that many insurance agents in Europe, not that many people want to put their risk capital and be risk warehouse shops there, the premium or the edge we get paid is significant, right? When when there's 30 insurance agents, right? The, the insurance margins are pretty thin, right? Okay. There's, there's not that many of us that want to put our, our capital at risk in that market. Yeah. I mean, just the commodity markets broadly, you've had this huge contraction in the number of you know, discretionary traders from, say, what it was in the 2000s. I mean, there's not a whole lot of you guys left right now, is there? No. The, I mean, the world went crazy with equities. It, it just, you know, you, you went to go raise money looking for your discretionary long short commodity trading. And they were like, do you trade equities? Are you long equities? Are you long equities? Can, can we buy the equities? You know, that, that's that's all you heard. And, um, you know, you had this massive run up from the Fed printing. And I, I guess it was the right thing to do because they were printing money all right. the time. Right. I mean, I mean, literally printing money. And so, you know, but that's that's changed and people are starting to pay attention to commodities. But we're, we're always an afterthought. You know, yeah. they can lose 50 percent of their portfolio and still want to be in equities before they jump into a commodity long short, generally, 
Right. <laughs> but, but commodities are too risky. <laughs> yeah, they're too risky. Exactly. Exactly. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a strange world, but I, I guess that's what's marketed the most to these, uh, the, the risk allocators of the world, the pension funds, the, the, uh, family offices, et cetera. Yeah. And I think it's probably fair to say you, you've got a very strong orientation in your trading style to looking at market fundamentals and then using option strategies to trade. And I think now with your London office, you're going to be trading natural gas, power, and carbon. Is that right? Yeah, we have we hired Nathan Arendt. He's over there. He's he's from the LNG days, and he's opening up the office. and And I, I've already been trading small, uh, significant, you know, as a percentage of our portfolio. But we wanted somebody full time with the time okay. differential, you know. So I, I'm not <laughs> up at <laughs> I'm not up at one thirty a.m. trying to figure out what's going on. And yeah, we'll be building out that risk book and the desk, hopefully, as time goes on. You know, when I was in high school playing football, I remember the coach used to say run where they ain't Perkins, run where they ain't. You know what I mean? And so like, (laughs) you got to go where they ain't. And so a lot of people are not in Europe, right? They're bailing out, they're blown up, uh, they're not allocating risk. And that's where you want to be, right? That's where you want to be in that market, right? You want to be putting all your fundamental analysis, your your programs, your research, the data you're buying over there. And I think you'll have a, a, you know, a very positive expected value position in Europe. Yeah. And I'm curious, like you've given us a little bit of the flavor of, you know, some of the fundamentals you're looking at for this winter. And when you look at those, what's kind of like the range of outcomes that you think are reasonably in play in Europe in some of these markets? <laughs> I mean, well, like we clearly have the run out of gas scenario, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that That's kind of interesting because, you know, the EU isn't the United States, right? They're kind of loosely together, right? Like, do you have yeah. certain states go, well, we're not going to ship you the gas, you know, that time, no transit fees, or we're not shipping you power, right? Like, does the European Union become stressed itself, right? Yeah. And th- those are secondary effects of like, you know, scarcity, right? Not lack of proper panning, years of policy of we don't drill, we don't put in infrastructure, we rely on Russia for our natural gas, right? And, th- and that's coming home to roost. And you have scenarios where, you know, there has been demand destruction. They have sent out a signal. The market has said, here, take the LNG. China says, we'll burn all the coal in the world. We don't care. Take your, you know, <laughs> take your LNG, right? And, um, w- and you can have a, a normal to a mild winter and you can just be flooded with gas in storage at the end of, at the end of March. So I, I think both tails are on the table. You know, they're completely on the table right now. And I would say that the no shutting off Ukrainian flows scenario is with a normal weather is 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 actually bearish, right? <laughs> Why is that? But that's a, you have a lot of demand destruction, you have a lot of flows. You sent a price signal, and high prices cure high prices, mm. right? Now, the problem in Europe is the person using the gas and paying for the gas is often not the same person, right? But right. but in industry and commercial, it is. And those guys, uh, you know, they're shutting down aluminum plants, smelters, you know, all, all the way through. And you just have enough demand destruction. And you've sent also a supply. I mean, there's uh, 92 LNG ships on their way to, to Europe right now. I mean, there's 260 ships on the water. It's almost, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're all going to Western Europe, right? Like, and so, and it doesn't look like they, they want to stop. And so that's, you know, storage is... 90%, 91% full in Northwest Europe as what we defined as Northwest Europe yeah. and, and it's on its way. So, you know, once you get the 92%, you start to have injection issues, right? Like you can't, you can't stuff it at the ground at the same rate and it starts to drop off precipitously. And so you're seeing that like cash was trading 30 euros back of futures, hmm. right? And you, you could see it in the, uh, the, the front spread, which was a premium, right? Ock versus Novi was a premium and now it's 15 euros back, call it five bucks back. I mean, and cash it is 30 euros back printing today. And, and, I, and I see that scenario getting worse as long as weather is normal. So you just have everything on the table here, weather normal down the fairway, you know, slightly bearish, but the volatility is so high, like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? Right? Like, what does it mean that it's bearish in, in this scenario? But as time evolves, you know, that, that will that will start to get more solidified one way or the other. And it's like, it's, it's such a great analogy and such a great point of view that, 
you know, I think traders like you have that I don't often see more from the policymaker side is that like a lot of times the focus is on what's the center of the fairway, you know, like, Hey, if we get the, you know, the big F of a normal winter, then we won't run out of storage and things should be fine. And that becomes the headline of the story. You know, we should be fine. But, you know, if both ends of the fairway are in play and they're both pretty disastrous because in the, you know, high gas price scenario, that's bad. And the low gas price scenario, part of that's also because you might have a very deep recession in Europe could be part of what brings a lower price scenario in play after the higher price scenario. I was curious, like, how do you get that type of scenario thinking and probabilistic thinking across to people? Yeah. I mean, how do you get it across? I'm, I, uh, that's an education question. It's it's really hard. You know, I, I, I guess people respond to visual cues. So I, I guess maybe kind of just show them the distribution of events, like what happens and some prices that what you estimate going on. I mean, that's the way we look at it, right? Like we're like, okay, here's the world as we see it now, right? This is the S and D. This is the demand destruction, et cetera. Run me the last 30 winners through these scenarios and show me how many come out. We're running out of gas, et cetera. Right? Like I think every trading shop does that. This is no, this is no fancy witchcraft here. And then, you know, you can start saying, well, what if Russian flows of this run the weather scenario? What if Russian flows of that? What if LNG flows of this? And you, we run, you know, you run that deck and you kind of say, okay, here is the distribution of what we see and what's right. possible. But like, you don't want to see a 30% chance of running out of gas, right? No. Like, you never want to see that, right? You don't even want to see 10 or, or, or 10% or 5%, right? And so that's what's pretty scary, right? Is, is, yeah, is, you don't is, want to go to the doctor and be told you have a 30% chance of a terminal illness. You know, yeah, it's, no. it's a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna. That's that's kind of what you you can see in some of these cards you pull up, right? Or, or, or these scenarios. And so I think, you know, my my view, and this is just my view, like policymakers just want to get elected and they want to look good. <laughs> so they say they, they're, they, you know, they're the bearers of good and sometimes false news yeah. or oftentimes false news. <laughs> yeah. And I want to get back to you about the, that policymaker conversation. But first, you brought up an earlier point that I think is really important. I mean, you saw opportunities based on a lot of the, the say, the structural developments in the European market. But of course, now this year, You know, the market's been dominated by this constantly shifting battlefield in Ukraine, Russia's use of energy as a weapon to kind of create a second front in that war. So how are you managing risks around the fact that, as you said, I think earlier, you could be a great gas trader, but not a great Putin trader? Like, so how do you think about managing risk in this environment? Yeah, we, we, I, I guess right now is is that one we're we're much smaller than we normally would be, and that's just a function of vol margins. I guess everybody's smaller, but the other thing is is that we're waiting for very extreme high favorite scenarios, right? Yeah. And tighter tighter spreads. You know, w- one of the things that recently we were looking at is is that hey, yeah, the winner might be crazy, and there's always going to be this like kind of war premium, the Putin premium, but there's a significant chance that they can run out of storage. Yeah. Right. To inject the gas. Right. They they can't inject as much as they'd like to carry to prepare for the winter, although they're going to send that price signal out. And so, you know, a month back, you know, ran ran the charts out. I was like, we should be short the front and long the back, <laughs> even though the market is backwardated. This market should be contango because there is a there's this X probability of getting to 100% full, yeah. right? You know, things happen and it changes to even 95%. So we, we started running numbers and saying, what's the odds that we get to 90% full by today? <laughs> Actually today, right? What's the odds we get to <laughs> 95, 95% full? What's the odds we get to 100% full by, you know, October the 15th? You know, 95 is a really dire situation with the amount of flows you're flowing right now. You just, yeah. and then- you know, in a normal weather scenario, could could is there enough uh, space? Is there enough demand plus injection demand to, to to handle that? And there were just too many scenarios that were like, no, <laughs> mm. right? Like, there's going to have to be some discount. And then there were all kinds of discussions of like, well, could they do floating storage? And then you know, guys were debating, well, how do you store if all the slots are already taken to regas in the winter? You don't really have firm regas rights in the winter, mm. so you know, you can't just sit there with a hundred million dollar cargo <laughs> hoping. To you know, yeah. get twenty dollars spread. So, you know, I, I don't know what the exact answer is, but I felt that enough of the distribution was that this thing backwardated, or this thing flat, or this even down a dollar is too tight, yeah. right? And so we stay kind of tight within season. 
it's one of the ways you could you can kind okay. of trade, right? Uh, you know, trade around uh, containment and running out. And then on a, on a longer term basis, that's a tougher. It's, it's a lot tougher. You know, the further you go out, your accuracy uh, decreases with time, <laughs> right? <laughs> Already, and and you know, when you go from let's say to the summer, we call that three trader lifetimes away because each season <laughs> is a trader lifetime that, because you can die in any season. Right. Uh, you know, we kind of, kind of look, okay, in the range of the extremes, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with demand destruction? Are these distributions reasonable? And can we put on a trade that expresses that, that, you know, we can survive being very, very wrong, <laughs> you know, because the name of the game is to stay in the game, right? Uh, the, the market will provide you outsized returns. You just need to stay alive. Even if you get cut in half, you'll have a chance to really come back and thrive as long as you stay in the game. That's great. Um, it, <laughs> yeah. Don't get, just don't get knocked out. You can get knocked down <laughs> bloody. You can do a nine count. They can cut your eye, but make sure you're able to go back in the ring. You'll eventually win. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. Um, and I wanted to turn, you know, because the other big risk, I think, is what are European policymakers going to do? And it seems like now that finally those prices are flowing through, they're hitting the residential consumers, they're hitting the, the small shops, the bakeries are shutting down. You've got a situation where policymakers feel a need to react and do something doesn't mean they'll do something productive, but you know, you got to at least be seen to be doing something. And I was curious, like, how do you manage risk in that environment, especially when they're kind of likely going to change the rules of the game, you know, cap prices, there's been talk of changing benchmarks and saying, Oh, we need something LNG related, not TTF related, even though, you know, it still might be for pipeline consumers. So like when the, when the rules of the game are potentially in play, how do you think about that? I generally, I'm going to go on a little rant at the end of this one, but to try and suggest what they should be doing. And then, and it's kind of a little bit what I was talking about before, but I generally view them to be who they are. And their, their primary concern is not actually solving the problem as you and I see the problem. It's solving the problem of how do I stay in office? How do I look good? How do I get reelected? Right. And so simple energy is a pass through, Right. It is over. <laughs> it is over. You will get 30% conservation out of the, the RC sector that you're worried about happily, right? They're, they're just not paying that much. And then, you know, their concern is like, well, we can't, people's high bills, they're angry. I'm not going to get reelected, right? That type of thing. And so that's kind of how they're always going to behave. So whether it's like, we're going to move the index over here, or et cetera, it's never solving the demand problem. It's not solving the LNG problem. It's just hiding it. It may push it further down the road and make it worse further down the road, but yeah. it's never really actually solving the problem. And so if you wanted to protect the consumer, I mean, you can get, you know, your chances of re-election. Here's something where you can actually solve the problem and get reelected. Just say, let's say your bill was $100 and now it's going to be 1000 right? And you don't want them to see the increase. So usually what they do is they just cap it and they pay the bill for them, right? So yeah. you have no demand destruction. I'm like, give them $900, but just tell them the price is the price. So the consumer, they're not paying anything extra, right? But they have $900 to make a choice. Spend it on energy or conserve energy and go out and party, right? So wait, I got a check from my government. Right. I, the price is a pass through. So there's no harm to the right. consumer. Right. But then they can, you know, what's going to really happen is that these guys are not going to like take the $900 and ship it back to Uniper. Right. Which is now a government controlled entity. They're going to take that. They're going to turn down their thermostats. They're going to winterize their houses. They're going to do everything. And you're going to see conservation that you've never, ever seen before on a scale you've never seen before in the RC amount. And you're going to solve the problem. Crisis over immediately. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like uh, when commercials hedge their demand, you know, using the markets, right? You've got the hedge, you can either take the money you collect on the hedge and uh, pay for your bill, or you can, you know, just uh, pass use it for it. something else. <laughs> it's, yeah, like, it's, it's, else. It's, it's your money, you can make your choice. Right, That's right. interesting. So, yeah, so it'd be empowering the consumer. So that, that would be like a policy shift where it's like, okay, we're doing kind of the socialist thing, but we're doing it the smart way. We're distributing it to the end user and letting them right. decide whether you're not you're not subsidizing demand in that way. You're actually destroying demand in that way, yeah. right? But I haven't heard that once out of anybody, out of any policymaker. 
they're politicians. They're not economists. They're not commodity traders. They don't they don't necessarily do that. And their their focus is on getting reelected and staying in power. Yeah, it sounds like it's a it's a, the stay in the game. <laughs> it's just a different game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a different game. Their game is different, right? You know, instead of an annual neck ass cycle, it's an election cycle, I guess. Yeah, and I, I'm just proposing a way that they can actually be superheroes. It's like, wait, I got nine hundred dollars, and and I got to keep you know really net to me two hundred dollars more to go spend, right? right? Not only that, you know, you you, you get it's a it's an economic boost. It's a direct ejection. That's great. I wanted to switch gears a bit with you because, you know, in addition to being a highly successful energy trader, you're also a highly successful poker player. And I was curious, uh, I mean, which were which were you first? Were you a poker player first? The stakes might have been lower. Uh, or were you a, a trader first? Definitely a trader first. Uh, I wouldn't call myself highly successful. I've been successful in tournaments, but cash games, it, it, I've gotten beaten up early enough that we're, you know, it's net, <laughs> it's net negative, you know, and, and it, I've gone through the school of hard knocks learning poker. But uh, when I was like a clerk, I got introduced to playing No Limit Hold'em and, you know, all the traders kind of, I, I think they're, traders have this natural, we like risk, you know, mm. and they like to gamble as entertainment. Right. When you're always when you're always a house, sometimes you just want to get lucky, I guess, you know, and socialize. <laughs> and that's kind of the, the the mentality of the floor, at least when I was when I was coming up. That's interesting because some people might think my, my day job trading stressful enough. I don't need it at the poker table. But it seems like if that's what you love, it's what you love. You know, there there's certain people who focus on the downside, right? They're just risk averse. And there's all there's people who are just like always pissed at missing the opportunity cost. Mm-hmm. And I think that's more traders, right? They're always okay. like what could have been? What could I make? They're not thinking about the downside. Ah, whatever. You know, like <laughs> if I die, I die. <laughs> you know, the, you know. And I think I think that's kind of the 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 bent of traders. And so you know, they 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 like action. That's fascinating. And you know, I was curious, what do you take from each? Like, what do you take from you know poker playing that you apply to the trading, or trading that you apply to how you think about playing poker? Like, what do you take from each that makes you better at the other? I think w- what they both do in, in different ways is trading and, and poker let you know about yourself. You go in and the market, it doesn't care. It doesn't have a vendetta against you. It's it's this kind of thing, right? The cards don't, okay. if you play poker, they, they, don't, they don't have any vendetta. They're going to come away. It's really how you react to every scenario, right? So like there's winning traders and, and losing traders and it's really how much did they study? How did they react to each scenario? Right. Mm-hmm. And then so you really, really learn about yourself when trading and, you, and the same is true with poker. Right. And when you find your leaks in your game, you know, like your leaks in your poker game, like, oh, you over bluff or you under bluff or you call too much or you, you know, th- those things you, you find like there's some there's something personal to you and your personality in your the way you are, maybe, you know, in your childhood that wired you to, to be this way and you need to unwire and fix this thing. Uh, yeah. in order to get better at poker. And, and I think the same is uh, w- with trading. Like if you're the type of guy that gets upset when you lose and get irrational or you hold on to a trade too long, right? When you should be getting out because whatever, you become attached or, or whatever. You know, there's all kinds of trading leaks that are out there. I'm not a trading psychologist, but, you know, I am very well aware of when things go awry and I've done things wrong, it's me. It's not the market, right? Bad things happen yeah. in a market. That's a guarantee, like the trading guarantee is something is going to go wrong. You're going to have this perfect thesis and boom, pull a vortex in your face, right? <laughs> or yes, it's bullish as all get out and uh, the market's going to infinity and Freeport LNG blows up and there's a ton of gas on the market and boom, we vaporize two, three dollars, right? Right. right? That's th- These things are just going to happen. Um, you don't know when they're going to happen. They're just, that's the bargain of life. That's the bargain of trading. And what really matters is how do you react to it? Yeah. That's great career advice for someone to carry with them throughout a trading career. And it might not be fair to ask you this question, but I also wanted to ask you, you know, for other less experienced energy traders in the European market this year, like what advice would you offer them for how to navigate, you know, what's going to be coming at them over the next three, six, 12 months? I guess one of the things I would say is that even the bad things that are happening when you're, you're making your thesis, et cetera, that volatility that got you is also what's going to pay you, 
right? So this is this is part of the game. Do not get too upset. Like, oh my God, this thing happened and it dropped 70 euros. And you know what I mean? I got hurt. You know, if you're in that game, like that is what's going to pay you. This volatility, this structure has set up, right? So, you know, we're all complaining like margins are crazy and I can't trade that much or whatever. I'm just like, this is because it's a, it don't worry there's a lot of juice and 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 you're needed i mean a lot of people they they look at trading uh like kind of useless i'm like we're needed we're risk warehousers guys don't want to be long we got to be long you know they induce us to be long guys don't want to be short they induce us to be short right like so you're needed hang in there keep your wits about you be rational and that's great because so much of the the policy discussion ends up being around you know first thing we do we'll go after the traders and the quote unquote I'll bar your air quotes, speculators, but to understand that, you know, the, the trading community is needed to make the market function and to transfer the risk. I think it's so important and that often gets lost in the conversation. Yeah. Um, they, they should use the word, we're risk warehousers. We take the risk that you don't want. Yeah. It's like the insurance company for our homes, <laughs> but yeah, it's exactly. for all the commodities it's, it's, we need. Same thing. Same thing. We're, glor- we're, we're really glorified insurance agents. If you're a fundamental, <laughs> if you're a fundamental trader, that's why I call us. I was like, we're, we're glorified uh, insurance agents, you know, producers come out and they're like, we want to sell a gajillion contracts so we can, you know, make the widget and the thing. And we're like, oh shit, where do we buy this thing? You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, it looks bullish here. I guess I I'll buy it. Right? This. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm going to buy it. And then it's like, oh my gosh, we're worried about running out of gas. You know, we're going to buy it. And we're like, oh my God, you actually could run out of gas. Where would I sell this thing? You know, right. like, so that's, that's what we do. We're just glorified insurance agents. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, because beyond being a glorified insurance agent, you also, you know, you're an author. And so yeah. I wanted to get, you know, and you're also, you seem like you have great equanimity for a, for an energy trader as well. And I, yeah. I'm wondering if part of that came from the philosophy in the book you wrote, which I hope I not get the term wrong, but it's like basically die with nothing or die with yeah, zero yeah. and die about with zero. collecting experiences as opposed to uh, dollars in the bank account. So I wanted yeah. to share a little bit of that just outlook on life. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I was younger and see, you know, in New York City, and you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a millionaire in New York City back on the trading floor, I was kind of like, well, what, what is what is all about? You know, I wanted to get rich before I was like thirty, and I was like, but why thirty? You know, you know, I used to think people were my age were like ancient and useless. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, the money was of no use. Now I, I got that wrong, but nobody says, hey, I want to be rich before I'm ninety, <laughs> right? And so, you know. What I quickly came to realize is the money is for the experiences you want to have. And depending on what those experiences are, they belong in a certain time bucket of your life, right? And it makes no sense to take all this risk, risk dying, risk being poor, the the scorn of your friends and family going, see, I told you, your peers mocking you. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, there's no sense in this. And then getting these chips called dollars and then dying with them sitting there, right? Like you want to use all the Chuck E. Cheese tokens before you leave Chuck E. Cheese, right? They have no cash value, right? And they have no cash value in the grave, <laughs> right? And so, <laughs> and so the, with the, the, the easy axiom that you want to spend all your money before you die in order to get the most out of life, right? And, and that, that can be charitable, that can be hedonistic. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm using experiences very broadly. It's what does that curve look like? Right. What, what, what is the, the distribution of those funds of your life in order to get the max out of it? Because I really don't care about net worth. What I care about is net fulfillment. Right. And I think most people are driving for net fulfillment. I think a lot of traders and people who are successful kind of lose sight of why they wanted to get successful. Right. It's kind of this abstract process or this kind of like roundabout process. Like you get the money to get the thing or the experience, right? But then you get good at getting the money and you forget the money is for the things and the experiences, right? And so then we kind of just go on and like a hamster on a wheel, keep getting money, 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 you know, kind of like the, those rat experiments <laughs> where, you know, you got to give the rat the cheese to run in the wheel. Right. And then and then eventually you don't even have to give him the cheese. He just runs, right? That's, <laughs> that's kind of like the human race uh, of, of the successful people. And so I wrote a book to try and save my own life to make sure I did not uh, waste my time here on earth. Thanks again to Bill Perkins, founder, managing partner, and head trader for Skylar Capital. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week with friend and former Smarter Markets host, Susan Sackmar. Susan will be back to discuss how the European energy crisis is transforming the LNG industry. This episode was brought to you in part by ABAX Exchange. 
market participants need the confidence and ability to secure funding for resource development, production, processing, refining and transportation of commodities across the globe, with markets for LNG, battery metals and emissions offsets at the core of the transition to sustainability, ABAX Exchange is building solutions to manage risk in these rapidly changing global markets. Facilitating futures and options contracts designed to offer market participants clear price signals and hedging capabilities in those markets essential to our sustainable energy transition. ABAX Exchange, bringing you better benchmarks better technology, and better tools for risk management. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, ABAX Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week.